fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery with your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino. John Copenhaver and Al Warren. Heard on KCB 106.5 FM Los Angeles. 102.3 FM Riverside. And 105.0 AM Palm Springs. Uh, we have a, a, another great guest and more in the field of paranormal. Uh, and um, he's recently read, written a book and it came out July 8th in 2018. And uh, the book was about his um, experience with uh, UFOs and, uh, and abduction, and it happened back in 1973. So uh, we are going to talk to him about his book. Uh, the book is uh, Pascagoula, and that's in Mississippi, and it's The Closest Encounter, My Story. And so the writer and our guest is Calvin Parker. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. So, so Calvin, um, before we get into the story, I noticed that this happened in 1973, and uh, you just put out the book last year. Um, what took you so long to actually decide to write and uh, publish the book? Well, 73 was a different time zone altogether, and something like this you would have been really ridiculed for, and all I wanted to do was just... Uh, Buy a house, get married, raise my children, have grandchildren, and retire. But I knew if I come forward with this, it'd have been a lot of ridicule and people wouldn't have believed it. But uh, more or less, I just wanted my life, and I kept my mouth shut about it, thinking it would go away. I said, "Well, this is my 15 minutes of fame, and it'll be gone and never be brought up again." But it didn't quite work out like that. Yeah, yeah, and that's I, that's kind of how it goes. You know, it's hard. It's hard, and especially nowadays, uh, everything's so public, and it's so easy to be um, attacked by people. It's not. It's not easy. Um, I, I noticed that your friend. So you were nineteen years old in seventy three when this happened, and you were with a friend, Charlie Hickson. Now he's since passed, I believe. Um, he was a little yeah. more open with this UFO research and all that, wasn't he? he? He was, and the night that this happened, we had talked about it. We Neither one of us was going to go public with it. And uh, I guess he took a different road than I did. And Actually, right after this encounter, I never spoke to him but one time after that. So, uh, you know, he took the road of going public and going to these seminars and uh, conventions and all. And I chose just to find a job and work and uh, speak to myself. Yeah, I understand that. I think I think we all do. Um, it's kind of one of those things that uh, people will judge you on, and it could affect everything in your life, from your job to your home and relationship. It's um, it's something. Um now, maybe maybe let's go back to, it was October 11th, 1973. So maybe let's go back and um, tell us what you were doing and uh, how how it started to happen. Well, I had just recently <coughs> moved to the Mississippi Gulf Coast to go to work on a new job for a shipyard and all. And it was with Charlie Hicks and... and uh, I knew him through my father. He was a good deal older than I was. So uh, I called him up and asked him for a job, and I moved down. Now, this is the next day is the day we got a duck over you know, But uh, I moved down, went to work for him, and we got off work that day. And we were working on a shipyard doing ship fitting. So when we got off, we kind of wanted to go somewhere and cool down. He suggested we go fishing, and that was a real good idea to me because we was at the fishermen. I mean, we would go all the time. So we got off work. We went 
to his apartment and got our spinning reels and stuff. And we went back to a place called the Old Shaw Peter Shipyard. And it had been shut down. But it used to be a grain elevator there where they unloaded grain off the ships and the fish would come up and eat them. And it was still a lot of fish coming up in that area. And we figured we might get lucky and catch one. Really didn't care if we caught one or not. So we drove down, and as we got out of the car, I was noticing what a mess this place was. And what that was is the storm, uh, the high water would bring trash and everything up out of the river, dump it on the shore, and then go out. And then people dumping their stuff over there and all. So uh, we managed to walk through there. It took about 15 minutes to walk through this mess. We found this little pier, and we sat down. And I was just, I noticed a trespassing sign when we went in. And I asked Charlie, you know, are we, do we need to be down here? They're going to put us in jail, run us off. He said, no, I fish here all the time. So we went to the pier, sat down, and I was looking across the river, and there was a big ship over there. And I believe it was a Coast Guard cutter over a big NOAA ship. It checks the weather offshore. And I was thinking to myself, how in the world do these ships float made out of steel? I, you know, in my mind, it was hard to comprehend, even though we built ships. And then all of a sudden, I seen a blue hazy light coming from behind us, off the bank, and the light went out across to the ship, so it made it come behind us, and uh, it was the color of the, the police cars and all had this color light on them, the blue hazy light. So I stood up thinking that, yeah, we're going to jail here for trespassing on, on private property. And about that time, Charlie stood up, and when he did, we turned around and looked. It was a bright light, light, one of the brightest lights I've ever seen in my life. It was blinding. It was so bright. Uh, just appeared. And what that was, that was a craft on the door opening. And I didn't realize what it was at the time that it opened. But as we got to where we could see, that this was probably a 100 yards behind us. But as we got to where we could see, there was three uh, creatures, I'm going to call them creatures, robotic-looking creatures coming toward us. And you couldn't really make them out because of the lights. But two of them got a hold of Charlie. One got a hold of myself. Now, I was scared to death at the time this happened and thinking about running, but it wasn't nowhere to run. And I felt an injection in my arm. And... That must have been some kind of tranquilizer or something that they had injected in us to calm us down. Because I automatically felt relief when uh, this happened. But I was, could still see, I had my all my senses about me. I could see, hear, smell, feel, but I couldn't turn. I was more or less paralyzed to look in the direction they had us pointed. I could move my head, roll it around. That's all I can move. Well, this uh, robotic-looking creature got a hold, levitated us up. Now, how they did that without breaking the arm or something, I don't know, but it just kind of levitated us up, took us in toward the crowd, and as I got in the door, I was wondering where all these bright lights was coming for us. So I, I looked in, and the walls was illuminating the light. There wasn't no light fixtures in there that I could see. Looked like all this light was coming out of the walls. Well, that kind of answered one of my questions. And then they made a little left, left turn and went a little ways and made a right turn. And they took me into what I call an examination room. Well, when they got there, the old big ugly creature, the robotic-looking creature, laid me on a... Uh, examination table at about a 45 degree angle and something came out of the ceiling about the size of a deck of cards and it just stopped it got right about a foot from my front of my head and it clicked it did that on the side it did this four times going around my head or clicked four times going around my head and then it just shot back up in the ceiling and I didn't see that all 
deck of card thing anymore, or camera, whatever it all is, MRI. And then the big ugly creature kind of stepped back, and there was a different one that came in. Now this one looked more human than, uh, didn't look like a human, but looked more human than the big robotic looking creature, what I call the soldier. And I'm assuming it was a she because of the bill. It had a small bill. And, you know, a man could just sense the presence of a woman or a man, and it, this just felt like a woman coming out. And her fingers and hands looked normal, but her two, her two center fingers there was a little longer than normal. So she reached up and grabbed me by the cheek, kind of pinched my cheek, felt my skin, and then took her fingers and run down my throat. And that little hangy thing at the back of your throat that everybody has, uh, she run her fingers back in behind it. So I'm assuming she was going to trying to get into my nasal cavity, which that was painful. And then when I started hurting and gasping for air and breathing, telepathically, her lips didn't move because I was sitting there looking at her. But she telepathically told me, she said, don't be afraid. We're not going to harm you. And then she quit and kind of backed up out of the wall. And that's when the old big ugly creature came back in there and grabbed me by the arm again. And I felt another injection. So that, I believe, was to calm me down. And uh, he picked us up, picked me up off the table, levitated me, floated me right back out to the river where I was. It put me out facing the rivers where my arms stretched. And I could move for just a second. And then I heard uh, the guy that was with me say, Calvin, Calvin, you okay, son? And that's when I turned around and noticed the, the bright light went off. So the door must have closed on the crowd. And it picked up probably two or three foot off the ground. And the blue lights kind of started. Then it just disappeared up into the air. And uh, that was just, just the starting of everything right there. So Charlie and I, the the the, dang, the danger was over, I felt. So we sat down on the pier to talk for a minute. We both agreed not to tell no one. He said he wouldn't tell no one. I knew I wasn't going to tell no one because all I wanted to do, again, was work. Uh, we ended up going back back to the car from there and when we got to the car the windows on the passenger side was shattered and the car wouldn't hardly crank or hardly run it took about 15 minutes to get the car where it would crank and that was a brand new car back then so we finally got it cranked and as we left in the state of Mississippi during this time or period well you also know there wasn't no cell phones but we didn't wear watches because we worked with metal in the shipyard and used hammers. So, we, you know, a watch wouldn't last long out there. Right. He's, let's go to this store up here and let me use the phone. I got to call somebody. I said, no, that that's going to be a mistake, Charlie. We don't need to tell nobody. I'm not telling nobody. So and we did. I stopped. He was older, and I was trying to listen to him. He got on the phone and he called Keesler Air Force Base out of Biloxi. So when he called Keesler Air Force Base, he told them what had happened. They said, well, this isn't a matter for us. We, you need to call the local authorities, which would be the Jackson County Sheriff's Department. So he came back to the car and hunted another dime, found one under his seat, and put it in the phone, and he called the Jackson County Sheriff's Department. And I could hear him talking. He said, uh, I got something to tell you, but you promised me not, not to laugh. And they said, oh, we're not going to laugh at it. Well, he told them what happened. And uh, I asked him when he got back, in just a second he come back to the car, I said, what, what did they say, Charlie? He said, well, they laughed. But for us not to leave here, they're going to have a patrol car here any time now. And that's what happened uh Sheriff's Department patrol car showed up. He walked up to the door where I was sitting, 
asked to see some identification, looked around in the car, told me to get out of the car, standing on one foot, uh, nailed my head back, touched my nose, well, closed my eyes, touched my nose with my right hand, jumped up and down. I said, man, I can't do that if I'm sober, much less if I'm going to be drinking. I said, but I'm sober. But anyhow, I went through his little sobriety test, and he made us blow in a little balloon, or whatever that thing is. And he says, you're fine to drive. He said, you just follow us back to the sheriff's department. So when we got to the sheriff's department, they took Charlie into one room. They took myself into a different room. They interrogated us both. They told me, look, if this is a hoax, you're going to jail for a long time. Of course, I knew it wasn't no hoax, so I wasn't worried about that. Then all of a sudden, they came in there when they separated us. They brought us back together, and they put us into another room. Well, little did I know that they had a tape recorder in that room, and they was tape recording everything we said. Uh, they let us stay in there a few minutes and and talk, just I guess just to see what we said. Now, I didn't know about the tape recorder up till you know, a pretty good while later. But uh, it it's had a full conversation where we was worried and scared. Well, when they heard that tape recorder, it scared them. They called the sheriff in to find out what to do with us. He come in, he talked to me for a minute. He said, well, uh, y'all go on home. I said, look, sheriff, I don't want nobody to know about this. I just got to the coast. I don't want to have to deal with this stuff. I got a new job. He said, we're not in the business of uh, spreading gossip or anything. We're in the business of enforcing the law. Well, I felt a little better about it then. So we both got in the car, and we drove back to Charlie's house. And on the way back, I got to thinking, you know, I don't know where these things came from. So, but I had watched that Apollo mission where they had quarantined them people for seven days because they might be afraid of a bacterial infection. So I got to worry about being infected with some kind of uh, something that would be contagious to somebody and radiation and I was worried that we would give it to somebody and it would spread around and just wipe out the planet more or less so when we got home I went into the bathroom pulled all my clothes off took my shoes off I put them all in a little bag and there was a gallon of bleach on the bathtub and I got that gallon of bleach and got in the shower and I just poured it over my head and rubbed it in even as painful as that was, I said, well, Mama used to bathe me in bleach to get rid of poison ivy and maybe this would kill some kind of disease. I showered off, I changed clothes. Well, the next morning we got up and I carried that little bag outside and I put it in a dumpster they had there. We went to work. When we got to work, I noticed there was more cars there than had normally been there. And, but I didn't think anything about it till I got out on the yard. They called over, sent somebody down, asked us to come up to the office. Well, when we got to the office, they said, we can't even conduct business here. Our phone's ringing off the hook. What went on? We want to know what happened. And that was the news media. They said, y'all going to have to get out of here so we can conduct our business. At a normal basis, you can't go back on the yard because everybody be asking questions. And I felt then that they might know something, but I didn't know to the extent what they knew. So anyhow, he said, we're going to have to tell the media something. We call in our attorney that handles this. We're going to get him to do a press release. Y'all tell him what happened. So we went into the story and told uh Joe Flamingo, their attorney, what had happened, you know. He gave a press release. It, believe me, it didn't satisfy him. But then, when I talked to the, when I talked to the sheriff, I told him, well, I have my concerns about, uh, spreading a bacterial infection or having radiation or something. He said, well, we're going to take y'all up, get you examined at the hospital. So we went to the hospital. They took us up in the patrol car. 
They gave us a real thorough examination. They seen the puncture marks on my arm, but they didn't figure we was contagious. So they said, now y'all need to be checked for radiation before we get around y'all much or have anybody else around you. We're going to send y'all to Keesler Air Force Base to be checked for radiation. So they got the deputy. He put us in a car, and he went straight to Keesler. Well, when we got to Keesler, they escorted us through the gate and took us in. They checked. There was about six men in hazmat suits out there. They checked us for something for radiation. One of them I heard say, you're all clear. They said, well, they want to talk to you in the conference room. We're going to escort y'all down the hall. Y'all need to talk to these people. I thought, man, I'd be so glad when this is over. So they escorted us down the hall, and they were extremely nice. They just had a, a few questions to ask, and they wanted to know what happened. This is all the officials that was there that said they didn't want to talk to us before the night before. And it was a few local officials along also, like the mayor and the police departments and things like that. Because this was kind of starting to cause panic because of the media rush. So they got through with us and escorted us back out to the patrol car. And on the way back to where we were working, where they picked us up where my car was parked, uh, they said that somebody come in that wants to talk to y'all. That was Dr. John Allen Heine. He was over Project Blue Book at the time. And Dr. Uh, Dr. Harder from the University of California. And I agreed to stay and talk to them for a few minutes. And while Heineck was interviewing me and asking me what was going on, Harder was giving uh, Charlie a physical, trying to hypnotize, or hypnotize me. And then we switched places. Heineck interviewed Charlie. He took me back and gave me a physical. And that's when he found two puncture marks on my arm. And that's what made sense to me because I felt the first one when we got abducted. And then the second one when I started panicking and they took us back out. So bottom line, Heineck says, well, I'm going to uh, the site tonight to look at it. And when he got back the next day, he wanted to see us a few minutes. So we stayed around the next day for just a few minutes. Give a press release. He said that he uh, knew that something had happened. He didn't know what had happened. And uh, if we was acting, we should be in Hollywood because we're better actors than he's ever seen, which I knew we wasn't acting. But I decided right then and there, I fixed to go back to my hometown, Laurel, Mississippi, and deal with this. So I told Charlie, look, I'm getting out of here. I'm going back home. Don't call me. I don't want to talk to you because you have to be the one that releases this to the press. But to come out, to find out later, at the time, you know, there was no cell phones or no social media. And what I found out later, I think everybody had a skin and they would scan the police departments and fire departments, just being nosy, seeing what was going on in the neighborhood. And I think that's the way the press got it. So I went back home, and I didn't know how to explain all this to my family and friends because I knew the news media had picked it up. It had went out international and national news. So... uh when I got home, I was dressed trying to explain this to my family. Well, I didn't want to talk about it. But none of them ever asked me about what happened. My friends never asked me about it. The only people that did was the new me news media. And they'd come out to interview you. And I'd make them mad because I wouldn't give an interview. So they'd just make up a bunch of stuff and, and tell it. And I, I, you know, I had never gave them an interview. I didn't want nothing to do with it. Now, Charlie took the other road. He went from day one. He started having press releases. 
he started uh, going on different talk shows. Johnny Carson, Dick Cabot, Tom Snyder, Bill, not Bill, but uh, anyhow, a few more talk shows. And he was taking this and going with it for some reason. I never figured that out. All I wanted to do was to settle down, find me a little job again, and, and get married and have children, have grandchildren, and retire. But it didn't work out like that. Everywhere I would go, the press would hand me, and they would come up with something. It was to the point I couldn't stay at home. I was due to get married. This happened in October. I was due to get married in November the 9th. And we got married. As soon as we got married, we went on the road in the oil field. And I just took different jobs. And when they would catch up with me, I would leave that job. So just to stay here. But we never talked about this thing. The reason the book even came around, just but 45 years later, uh, we was at a wake. And this is for. 45 years later, I went to the wake of a friend uh, and a neighbor. And we was there, and I signed the register. Now, I had already moved back in the area of Pascagoula and staying real quiet, and everybody minding their own business, not trying to get in the mind. And uh, I signed the register, and somebody from Texas recognized my name. They said, are you the one? And I just politely said, no. no. They said, yeah, you are. You, you're... You're Calvin Parker. I said, look, this is not the place to talk about this. I had a respect for this man's family. So I told my wife, let's get in the car and go. But on the way home, she said, why don't we, why don't you write a book about all this? I said, I don't have education. I don't have much of an education at all. If I write one, it would have to be a ghostwriter to write it. And I said, I'll see if I can find one. But when I told her that, I wasn't serious. I was just trying to get her mouth shut so I, you know, wouldn't have to hear about a book no more. Well, as it happened, we got home the next day. Philip Mantle uh, called on a different related issue. He had went through, been hunting me for years, and he found, and he called, and I accidentally answered the phone. Because if I had known who it was, I wouldn't answer the phone then. I didn't know Philip from anybody. Well, we started talking, and he asked me something about Charlie's book. And he said, why don't you write your own book? I said, because the press changes the story. Everybody I talk to makes changes in the story. And that, that's why I don't write my own book. And I said, because, and, and again, I don't have the education to do that. He said, well, look, look at it this way. If you put it in right, in black and white, that'd be your legacy. Nobody can change that but you. And it got to making a lot of sense to me when he said that. And I had been running for this for years and not wanting to face up to it. So I said, well, give me a while to think. And he called back in about a week. And I was hoping he would uh, forget about it. But we talked again, and he actually made a lot of sense with what he was saying. So that's when the decision came up to write the book and why it took so long to write it. Calvin, but, uh, yeah, yes, fascinating, fascinating story. Thank you for sharing it. And um, I'm sure that everybody listening will have been absolutely chomping at the bit, trying to, um, wanting to ask you questions as you went through it. But we, we kind of left you just talking because it was so important to hear your journey from beginning to end. I'm going to play devil's advocate a little bit, okay? And I'm not saying I disbelieve your story because that's not the case whatsoever. Okay. Why, do you th why do you think it was such a big deal? So you described this, this publicity, everybody wanting a little piece of yourself and your friend to tell a story, to be in the public eye. And then you describe 
having to move from place to place so the story doesn't catch up with you. And when it does, you have to change jobs. What, why, what was the interest? Why did people feel the need to do that? What, why was it so important for you to be not known in the story? Well, if you remember back in 1973, uh, this wasn't a real popular subject. And, you know, I've had people walk behind me going beat, 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 and stuff like that. And I was kind of quick-tempered back in, too. And I, I just didn't want to hear all of that. I wanted a normal life. And to me, it was a big deal when you moved. And looking back, back on it, the thing I should have done was, like Charlie, come out and gave a good interview, made a few talk shows. And I believe they would have dropped it and it would have been over with. But then Charlie took the other road to write a book and keep it in in publicity and keeping the headlines out and doing the talk show. And uh, I just didn't want to be thought of as crazy or the UFO guy or Sputnik. They called me that a time or two. But actually, the ridicule didn't bother me much. They didn't know. I wasn't going to repress release. My friends didn't know. I never talked to them. My, my wife, the first time she heard the story was when the book came out. She asked me a little bit about it. I said, well, read the book. So, you know, I just didn't want to talk about it. It was dramatic. And it was uh, but you were a married, lot more. Uh, you were married fairly soon after the incident. So how did your wife not know about it when all of these people were hounding you? That's the bit I'm, I'm well, struggling. Well, she did know about it. Everybody knew what happened. My whole family did. I mean, it was plastered all over the media. But at, at the time we got married, I was 18 years old. She was 16 years old, and she was scared to death to even talk about it. So we just chose not to talk about the facts in it. She knew I'd been abducted, but I never talked about what had happened to me at the time. I'd blow it off. And so, and, and so now that you, you are... Obviously, clearly, before the book came out, you started to talk about it because you were you would have been preparing for the book. What is yes, what was her view? What was her view then? How did? Thank you, pardon. You broke up. How did it change your relationship once you did know and understand what you've been through? Well, I have to say. We've been closer since the book come out than what we had ever been in our life. I mean, she looked at it as well. He finally sat down and talked to me about this, explained it to me, let me know what all he's going through, shared it with me. And she helped a lot on the book, you know, because uh, we would talk about it and I'd share my information on paper. And so, so it, it opened it opened you, us up to each other. Do you avoid fishing now? Beg your pardon? I said, do you avoid fishing now? After this such a dramatic experience in your life, I, I'm uh, not sure to go. Absolutely not. I bought a place in the Mississippi, six miles from where this happened, on the water. I keep my boat in the water all the time. We go in daytime. We go at night. We fish probably five days a week after I retire, and we wait to go again, but it's been raining so much here. Now, I did avoid it until 1993, and uh, I went fishing one day in 93 and told her, look, I'm going to be back at dark. And I hadn't been venturing out too much up until then. So I got... She made me a lunch. I got in a boat and I went out fishing. And I was sitting there eating my lunch. And I told her I'd be back before dark. This is about 11 o'clock. And the next thing I knew, it was 3 o'clock in the morning. Now, I didn't know how that happened. That bothered me. That was missing time. And this is where I went to see Bud Hopkins. Because I knew he was uh, experienced with missing time because he had written a book on it. Or a friend told me that he had. Does, um, but, 
for you, for you now sharing this story with everybody, you're you're obviously more confident in yourself. You're confident that, that times have changed, so you're able to share this story without too much um, too much criticism or critique. What do you, exactly right? Have you have you experienced anything similar since that event in 1973? I have, and the way I found out about it, that fishing trip in 1993 that I went on. Now I didn't realize this. Actually, I had all this missing time. I didn't know where it was. I got back to the house, and a friend of mine was there. Well, he keeps up with all what goes on. He's kind of a mini urologist, you whatever they call him, and he kind of keeps up with this. He said, "You know, you need to go see Bud Hopkins. He's written a book on missing time, and let's see what he has to say." So we drove from Florida. That was a 12-hour ride over there where we went to uh, see Bud Hopkins. I said, now, I don't want to personally see him if he's in a UFO conference. I don't even want to walk in the building. So you go in and tell him I'm out here and explain who I am and see if he'll talk to me. Well, uh, he went in, and, of course, Bud knew my name. I figured it all be forgotten gone by that time. He said, yes, I want to talk to him. So he said, y'all go to my motel room, and I'll see y'all in an hour or so. Well, it wasn't long, but showed up at his motel. He sat down in there. We talked for a few minutes. I explained to him what went on. He said, let me hypnotize you. I said, well, I don't know so much about that. I've seen these floor shows in Las Vegas where they hypnotize people, make them get up this stupid stuff and put stuff in their head. I said, I don't want nothing put in my head that's not there. I don't want to act stupid. And if you do this, I don't want nobody to know about it. And he said, I'll pick it. He said, I'll put a post-hypnotic suggestion in your head where you can't remember this. So he hypnotized me. It must have been about an hour and a half of hypnosis. Well, when I was doing the book, I didn't remember being hypnotized. I didn't think he could hypnotize me. But when I was doing the book, the publisher, Philip Mantle, I had mentioned to him, well, you know, I went to see Bud about this. He tried to hypnotize me, but he couldn't. Well, he got all over that. He knew Bud was dead, so he called Dr. Jacobs. And Dr. Jacobs had all Bud's records, and he also had an original copy, copy of the tape. So he, Dr. Jacobs called me and asked about to send, uh, if he could send Bill a tape, I said, give the man anything you want. Well, during this process, we were still writing a book. Bill was gathering up all the evidence he could gather. I was putting the words about my story in the book. Well, Philip come online one day and he emailed me the transcripts to the book. And I just opened them up, fixed the real map for a minute. And gosh, you know, I found out stuff that I didn't know and started opening it up in memory. I went out, my wife was on the back porch, so I went out and told her, you know, I was really hypnotized for a while. I said, but, I'm not reading these transcripts because I don't want to put uh, stuff in my head that's not in my head. And i tell you what jogged my memory. I did an interview with Linda Moken Howe, and apparently she'd done her homework real good. And she started asking questions about where I was hypnotized on there. And my memory just started coming back. It was just like watching a TV coming back so good. And then... I would read what I would remember from the tape, and it was dead on it. So, you know, that wasn't put in my head, and I knew it wasn't because that friend of mine that went with me, I trusted him, and he wasn't going to let Bud Hopkins put nothing in. I remember calling Philip and saying, you know, that man really had me hypnotized. I didn't know I was even hypnotized. But it's a long, long story in there where it goes. But I was actually abducted again, and me and this uh, female-looking creature 
had gotten a physical confrontation because I remember thinking, well, I'm not going to go through all this again, so I'm going to take her with me. So I grabbed her around the neck, and I was going to jump out. If they found me, they was going to find me with her in my hands, and I was going to have physical evidence. But we ended up getting into it pretty bad, and then that robotic creature, the same one, come in. All, all the transcripts are in the book. So what do you think the most important thing people can get from reading your book? Well, since the book has come out, and it's not so much my story, but it's the physical evidence that I believe would hold up in a court of law if you sent it there. I know uh, we have eyewitnesses. We have polygraph tests. We have voice stress tests. Uh, just anything, any kind of uh, witness thing. And it's still eyewitnesses coming forward to that. And it shocks me when I have a book signing or something that come forward. They said, well, you know, my parents was living then, and they told me about it. Or sometimes the parents would still be alive, and they'd say, well, you know, I remember seeing something that night. But uh, anything in court, I think it's worth reading. It's not one of these books that's just made up and put together and after the sale. When I did the book, I told Philip, do not edit. The way I'll do this book, and he's abided by my words, the way I'll do this book, if you do not edit a word in the book, I mean, don't punctuate it, don't edit any of the spelling. You put this book in my words, and I don't care if people like it or not or buy it, but that, then it's going to be my legacy. It's going to be in my words. And he stayed by his word on that. And I've heard people say, you know, we've read the book, and it's like sitting in the living room and you telling the story. And slowly, the evidence is building up to prove a point. Back then, it was unheard of to uh, abductions and anything like that. The closest one I remember would be Betty and Barney Hill. And I believe their story because afterwards I went down to see Betty Hill. And the reason I believed her because in the 60s, there was no such thing as a mixed marriage without a lot of problems. And she had a mixed marriage with Barney. And uh, I said, well, you know, if she had put herself through this, to put it out there publicly, that a white woman and a black woman, man was married, I'm going to listen to her because if she's brave enough to do that, I'm brave enough to want to see her. And I did. I went and met her. I spent three or four days with Betty Hill. And that was a, a great three or four days I spent with her. And I believe what she says. So now, do you have a place where people can get in contact? Or if they have a, um, a story of their own or something they want to share with you, do you have um, a website? I don't have a website. It's under Philip Mantle's The Flying Disc blog. It, just type in flying disc backslash backslash dot com. But I do have a Facebook page. And everybody is uh, contacting me on that Facebook page. And I hear some great stories on there, some real believable people. But it's like anything else. Then you hear some, it's not just so believable. But I listen to everybody's story, and we talk about this. So what's your plans next? Where do you go from here? Well, I had told Philip, look, I'm doing some conferences this year that I'm obligated to. So I'm going through these conferences. And uh, in October, I bought a houseboat, and I'm planning on getting it, and I'm going off grid then. I can care less if I ever talk to anybody or not. I'm throwing my phone away. But I will contact him because, you know, we do have a similar business relationship. And I want to keep up with what uh, what's going on about this because if there's any evidence, hard evidence that comes forward, I want to know about it. And I want to know about it because of me, because to see where it leads to. 
Well, what a what a what interesting story, and uh, we're glad you're able to share it with us. Um, and we wish you the best going forward. Um, our guest has been uh, Calvin Parker in the books uh, Pascagoula, uh, the closest closest encounter, my story. Um, thank you for being on the show, Calvin. Thank you. I've enjoyed it. To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. Show is over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.